This lecture is called The Heat is On, and it's going to introduce us to the concept of heat as well as kind of bring in the information that we learn about the conservation of energy and try and relate the two. So the first thing we want to do is say it doesn't make a difference what temperature a room is, it's always room temperature. So if we take a look, our learning goals are number one, that you be able to differentiate between heat and temperature. A lot of times they're used interchangeably in common everyday language, and so you need to be able to tell the difference between them. Also, you should understand the relationship between heat and temperature with the equation Q equals mc delta t. So that's an equation from your star chart. So you should be able to use that equation um, and to solve for any unknown variable. So in the heat is on investigation, what we saw is that uh, when you increase the heat, it does not always lead to an increase in temperature. We saw a graph that looked something like this, and uh, we had these points where we, the liquid or whatever it was was on the burner, and there was no change in temperature whatsoever. So we're going to need to account for that as well. Okay, Thermal energy, which a lot of times people interchange with heat, but thermal energy is the sum of potential and kinetic energy. Okay, increasing the thermal energy does not always increase temperature. So for example, if I have a cup of water at 10 degrees Celsius, and I have a swimming pool of water at 10 degrees Celsius, the 10 degrees Celsius swimming pool has a great deal more thermal energy than the cup, even though they're the same temperature. Okay, thermal energy represents the sum of the potential and the kinetic energy at that particular point. And because the pool has that much more potential energy, it's going to have more thermal energy. Temperature is actually a measure of molecular motion. Now you look at it and you say, well, the thermometer says it's so many degrees outside. Um, that's true, but what it's doing is it's indirectly measuring how fast the average speed of the molecules in the room are. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different temperature scales, but for the purposes of this class, we will use Kelvin or Celsius, unless otherwise stated. Uh, we tend to stay away from Fahrenheit. If you look, there's, um, there's a conversion to Celsius from Fahrenheit and to Kelvin from Celsius, because those are the things that we want to be in. We don't really want to be in Fahrenheit. The United States is actually the only country in the world that uses Fahrenheit as a standard scale, and it means a lot less than the Celsius and the Kelvin for scientific basis. It's, it's not like we're throwing it out just because we want to be like everybody else, but the Celsius scale is actually based on the temperature of water, and the Kelvin scale is actually based on absolute movement. So there's there's a more of a scientific basis behind the Kelvin and the Celsius scale. It's not just something somebody said, oh, well, I think this is zero degrees. So that's why we tend to throw them out. I throw out the Fahrenheit temperature. Absolute zero is the lowest theoretical temperature that is possible. Okay, It is defined as the temperature in which all motion stops and entropy is at a minimum. Now, we've never actually reached absolute zero. What we've done is we've said, okay, I've got experimental data that gives me this, and when I extrapolate that data out, I end up with a temperature right here of something like minus 273 degrees Celsius, which actually turns out to be zero degrees Kelvin. So zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. It's the lowest theoretical possible temperature, and that's why a lot of times you'll see scientists use the Kelvin scale because there are no negative values. Um, but zero Kelvin is, is the absolute lowest temperature. Now that translates into minus 273.15 degrees Celsius and approximately negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now you don't need to know those because once you know zero Kelvin, you should be able to use these formulas that we just looked at in order to convert back and forth between them. Okay, what you see here is you plug in the number for Fahrenheit, it'll allow you to go to Celsius. You plug in the number for Celsius and it allows you to go to Kelvin. So the phase of matter and temperature. Solid molecules are molecules that are stuck together and only allow a small vibration. So one thing that's kind of a misnomer is that molecules are stuck in the solid phase, that they don't move whatsoever. Uh, that's not actually the case. They do move. They move very, very quickly, and they move a very, very small amount, but they do move. Liquid, uh, they're actually they're rigid in their location. So like this thing right here is going to vibrate back and forth, but it's not going to move over here. Okay. A liquid, on the other hand, is one in which the molecules are free to move about within the container. They can't escape gravity, so they can't go up here, but this molecule can easily move all the way to the other side while this one moves over here. 
Okay, that's the difference between a solid and a liquid. Both can't escape gravity, but the liquid allows for free movement within its, within its volume. Okay, a gas, on the other hand, is where a molecule has a sufficient energy to overcome gravity. So its kinetic energy is enough where it can overcome the potential energy due to gravity, it can escape the container. Whenever it does that, it actually spreads out as far as possible to kind of increase the entropy. We'll talk about entropy a little bit later, but it's trying to spread out as far as possible. So if you look at these in terms of density, we, we know that for the fact that, <clears throat> generally speaking, objects are the most dense when they're a solid, they're slightly less dense whenever they're a liquid, and they are the least dense when they're a gas. Now there's one exception to that, and that's water. Um, you probably learned that in your chemistry class, but, but for the most part, the density decreases because the molecules are stuck together versus if they're free to move. Okay, heat, on the other hand, so we haven't really talked about heat so far. Heat is the transfer of energy uh, between two objects of different temperature. So for example, if I have something that is 10 degrees Celsius, Kelvin and 100 degrees Kelvin, there will be a transfer of energy between these two things. The molecules in this are moving much, much faster. The molecules in this are moving very, very slow. So we want to reach what's called equilibrium, in which you have the same average uh, energy per particle. So what you're going to do is you're going to transfer some of those, some of that energy. And how that occurs is these molecules will actually collide with these. And when you do that, you have a flow of heat. Heat is the transfer from high temperature to low temperature. It's never the reverse. It's always going to be from high temperature to low temperature. As a result, heat can re result in an increase in kinetic energy, which we know is temperature, or it can actually uh, increase the potential energy by changing the phase. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, on the next lecture. But energy is measured in joules, just like we've learned about before. Energy is measured in joules, and heat is a form of energy. So you can just substitute heat in there. Um, there's a common unit called the calorie, and one calorie is 4.184 joules, but, but joules is the standard unit of measure. Thermal equilibrium. So this is one of the key concepts for this particular chapter. Um, objects will always tend to move towards thermal equilibrium, and that's the point in which there is no net change in heat. So if you have something at zero and something at 100, you touch them together, they'll be 50 each. It's not like this will all of a sudden go, I'm going to be 120 and I'm going to be negative 20. It doesn't work that way. They tend to move towards thermal equilibrium, which is where there's no net change in heat. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not collisions occurring. It just means that the net result of those collisions is zero. So energy is transferred when atoms of high energy collide with energy, um, atoms of low energy. So this is the first example. It says which travels faster at the same temperature? You have an oxygen molecule or you have a nitrogen molecule. And it says to justify your answer using the clear method. So remember, when they're the same temperature, what that means is they have the same average kinetic energy. Now remember, the formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mass velocity squared. So when I say they have the same kinetic energy, you can say, OK, well, this number is the same in each particular case. So 1 half mv squared for nitrogen has to equal one half mv squared for oxygen. So what becomes the, dis the distinguishing factor in this particular case is, is the mass. And if you look, the mass and the velocity are kind of a product of one another. So if you were to increase the mass, you would have to decrease the velocity of the particle. So you look and you say, which one of these has more mass, an oxygen molecule or a nitrogen molecule? And if you would look at your periodic table, which you probably don't have handy, a nitrogen molecule has a mass of 28 AMU, and an oxygen molecule has a mass of 32 AMU. So as a result, the oxygen has a greater mass. Well, if it has a greater mass, it's going to have a lower velocity. So if I'm trying to justify this, I would say, which one's going to be the fastest? I would say, clear, it would be nitrogen. Uh, the evidence that I have to support that is that nitrogen has less mass than oxygen. And my reasoning, my justification for this particular um, statement would be the fact that this is kinetic energy. And whenever you have the kinetic energy, if you have the same kinetic energy, the one with the larger mass will be moving the slowest so that those two values can equal each other. Now, no calculations are actually required, just kind of an understanding of the fact that temperature is kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. 
Next it says a can of hot soup is placed on a windowsill to cool. Describe what is occurring at the microscopic level. So what you have is you have, <clears throat> if you were to draw a surface, you have soup molecules and you have air molecules. Now the air molecules are of lower temperature. So when the soup molecules and the air molecules collide, energy is transferred from the soup molecules, which have a high temperature, to the air molecules, which have a low temperature. When the collision occurs, some of that energy is transferred and it's carried off by the air particle, and that air particle now has a higher temperature. So heat flows from the soup to the air, and the air molecules will actually carry away some of those energies by that energy by collisions. Uh, example A3 says, which has more thermal energy, a single cup of coffee at 80 degrees Celsius or a swimming pool at 10 degrees Celsius? Well, remember the thermal energy is the combination of both potential energy and kinetic energy. So there's no way of knowing for sure unless you knew the size of the swimming pool, but generally speaking, you could say for an average swimming pool, the fact that it, there's so much more water, it's going to have so much more potential energy that the fact that the coffee is hotter and has more kinetic energy on average isn't going to be enough to cancel out the fact that there's just so much more of the sample here. So because of that, the one that's going to have more thermal energy is going to be the swimming pool at 10 degrees Celsius. Now that assumes it's a normal size swimming pool. I mean, if you have a swimming pool that's, you know, basically like a larger cup of water, then it would be the one with more kinetic energy. But it should be the pool. The next one says, you have a single tub of popcorn at the movie theaters can have 3,200 calories. Now remember, this is a capital C calorie, which actually means that it's a kilocalorie. And so the question that we have now is, how many joules of energy is this? So this is just a dimensional analysis question. There's no real calculations per se. You're just converting units. Remember, when you're doing dimensional analysis, you want to start off with what you have. To avoid any confusion, I'm going to go ahead and say kilocalorie because the capital C really means kilocalorie. And remember, you have one kilocalorie, that is the same thing as a thousand calories. And the definition that we had of a calorie is one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So whenever you multiply this out, you see kilocalorie cancels, calorie cancels, and what I'm left with is joules, which is what I want to be in. That's the standard unit. So I'd say, okay, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, and what I end up with is an answer of 1.34 times 10 to the seventh joules. Now you should notice that a joule is actually a very small unit of energy as a result of this. I mean, a tub of popcorn, you're, took, you're taking a look at tens of millions of, of joules. So a joule is a small amount of energy, uh, but it is that's why we tend to use bigger units like kilocalories. Uh, example A5 says a 300 Fahrenheit piece of iron is touched to a 400 kilo, um, Kelvin piece of brass. What direction will heat flow to reach thermal equilibrium? So the one thing that people automatically go to is they say 400 is bigger than 300, so it flows from high to low. But you have to make sure that you notice the scales, Fahrenheit and Kelvin. It's impossible for you to tell what direction they flow in until you know that they're in the same particular temperature scale. So what I need to do is I need to convert this 300 Fahrenheit into Kelvin. So the first thing, the first step along that way is taking Fahrenheit and I need to convert it to Kelvin. Or excuse me, to Celsius. And then from Celsius convert it to Kelvin. Um, so the formula that you have is you're going to say, okay, Celsius is equal to uh, 5 ninths, okay, which is that 0.556 number. And then you have F minus 32. Okay, so you would plug in 300 for F you would subtract 32, you would multiply it by 5 ninths, and you would get your temperature in Celsius. So when you get your temperature in Celsius, you realize that to go from Celsius to Kelvin, all you need to do is add 273, generally 0.15. We usually leave the 0.15 off because it's not particularly relevant. But whenever you do that, your final answer in this case would give you a temperature in Kelvin of 422 Kelvin. What you should realize now is that the 422 Kelvin is actually hotter than the 400 Kelvin of the brass. So in order for this to make sense, you would say that the heat flows from the iron into the brass, or heat flows from, um, I would say, iron into the brass. 
Okay, we're not going to ask you to do a whole lot of temperature conversions, but you should be familiar with them, especially if you're used to the Fahrenheit scale. Um, it's really important if you t if you travel and those sorts of things that you be able to convert and understand how you're supposed to dress based on the temperature. In the heat is on investigation, we used a small amount um, <clears throat> because a large amount of water would take a large amount of time. So we used a really small amount of water. And the reason for that was because um, it, water has an incredibly high resistance to changing temperature. And that's really one of the factors that we want to investigate is how come metal heats up relatively easily and water does not. So if we were to take a look at it, how would our investigation have changed if we have used oil or methanol or some other substance? And as a result of these, if we have changed the substance, the temperature would have, instead of gradually increasing like it did with water, the temperature would have really spiked. Okay, and so because of that spike in temperature, that difference in as far as how easy or difficult it is to change temperature, we really need to pay attention to what substance it is that we're heating. And what that is called is that is called the specific heat capacity. Now we make our pots and pans out of metal because they change temperature easily and we want to heat something up when we put it in a pot or a pan. Now if you make a pot or a pan out of wood, it's going to be very, very different because wood has an incredibly high specific heat capacity. That means it's very difficult to change the temperature of wood. So that tends to be like if whenever you want to put like a hot pan whenever you want to put a hot pan on a table a lot of people will actually put a wood um, some sort of piece of wood underneath it and that will actually act as a barrier so that it doesn't warp whatever table you're on so it, the specific heat capacity becomes really really important what it is is a measure of the energy required to change one kilogram Pellets have incredibly high specific heat capacities. It is very difficult to change the heat or the, change the temperature of a solid. Liquids tend to have medium specific heat capacities and gases have extremely low specific heat capacities. It is incredibly easy to change the temperature of a gas. Okay, Much, much more so than a solid. Now, once again, like we always have, water is an exception. Water is where a solid is actually less than liquid. It has to do with hydrogen bonds and all sorts of chemistry things that you learned last year. But know that water is an exception. Other than that, the trend is solid liquid gas in terms of high to low specific heat trends. These specific heat trends actually become very important to temperature. It is measured, uh, it's, it's units of the joules because it's an energy. Uh, it says that it's calculated. There are some indirect ways of, of measuring them. Um, but because you can't write, it's not one of those things that you can fundamentally measure. So we tend to say that you have to calculate it. Um, CP is the specific heat capacity. So whenever you see CP, it stands for capacity. And that's the energy that's required to raise one kilogram of material by one degree Kelvin. Okay, then that's so you see the unit is joules per kilogram K. Sometimes you see joules per kilogram Celsius. So sometimes this, kel this Kelvin is a Celsius. And it actually makes no difference because one degree Celsius is the equivalent of one degree Kelvin. Now it is not the equivalent of one degree Fahrenheit, so you should just be aware of that. Okay, and once again it's calculated. Then you see mass. Mass is the amount of matter. It makes sense that the more mass you have, the more difficult it is to change the temperature. And that's in kilograms, and we've talked about that a lot. And finally what you have is delta T, which is the change in temperature. And so you have to subtract. Remember whenever you see a delta T, remember that represents the final Minus the initial temperature. So just, just be aware of that when, as you move forward. And you can measure it with the thermometer or, or a lot of times people use temperature probes. But you see the example here. It says example B1 describes this, describe the uh, circumstances necessary for heat to be negative. So if you were to look at the equation, the equation is Q equals Cm delta T. So if I want Q to be negative, I've got a couple of options. I can have either one of these be negative or three of these be negative, because if you were to have two negatives, two negatives multiply a negative and a negative, you get a positive. So let's look through it in all of the variables and see if it makes sense for them to be negative. The first one is the specific heat capacity, and that's the energy that's required to change the temperature one degree, or energy to, to raise it one degree. So would it make sense for you to take energy away and have the temperature go up? And that makes no sense, so that's not possible. Okay, the second one is mass. If we were to look, is it possible for mass to be negative? 
can you have a negative amount of matter? And the answer is no. The least amount of matter that you can have is zero. So it makes no sense for mass to be. So the only way that you can have heat be negative <clears throat> is if you have a negative change in temperature. In other words, that the final temperature is going to be less than the initial temperature. So something like uh, 20 minus 100. And then the answer would be negative 80, and then you would have a negative Q value. So when you have a negative Q value, what you're saying is heat is leaving the system, and as a result, you have a lowering of the temperature. Example B2 says, which object will undergo the greatest temperature change, assuming that you have equal mass? So once again, we take a look at the formula Q equals CM delta T. It says to assume that we have equal mass. So mass is canceled out of this particular equation. We're going to assume that we put the same amount of heat into it. And so you say, OK, which one of these circumstances is going to give me the greatest change in temperature? So if I want a great change in temperature, what I want to do is I want to have an extremely low specific heat capacity. And the one that works best in this particular case is plutonium. Now, the substance that we tend to use a lot of the time whenever we do not want to change temperature is water. And the reason why we use water is because its specific heat is 4,184. So it is incredibly difficult to change the temperature of water. You have to put f almost 4,200 joules of energy uh, to change one kilogram of water by one degree. And that's, that's a really, really high amount. Example B3 says determine the final temperature. We're actually doing a calculation here of one kilogram sample of water. If the sample contains uh, is initially at 273K before being subjected to 100,000 joules of heat. So we want to use the formula Q equals CM delta T. So we look and we assign our variables because we, <clears throat> excuse me, we know we're looking for the final temperature. So we'd say, okay, the first value of one kilogram I know is a mass. The next value, it says 273. I can recognize that as the initial temperature. Um, you see it's 100,000 joules of heat, so you know you have your Q value is 100,000. And when you look at this, you say, okay, well, I'm missing the C value. I need the C value in order for this to work. A lot of times you will see it left off. It tends to be on formula charts and not listed in an actual question. But the specific heat of water is 4,184 joules per kilogram degree Kelvin. Or it's not degree Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. So now I have all my missing information, so I can go ahead and plug in the equation. I would say 100,000. Oh, got one too many zeros there. Equals 4184. And then my M value is 1. And then I can actually leave it as delta T, and I can solve for delta T first, or you can go ahead and plug it in and and solve it directly. It just kind of depends on your preference as far as things are concerned. I'm going to go ahead and just say TF minus 273. Um, and then when you do this, you end up solving. You would divide both sides by 4,184. Okay, when you do that, this is going to cancel out. So you have 100,000 divided by 4,184 equals TF minus 273. So you have to add 273 to both sides, and then you can input it in your calculator. So you take 100,000, you would divide by 4,184, and when you got an answer for that, you would add 273 to that, and the resulting temperature you would get would be a final temperature of about 297 Kelvin. It says heat and energy. It says the law of conservation of energy requires that energy cannot be created or destroyed. And so the heat that is gained by the suit must come from the heat that is lost by the fire in our particular example. And what you see here is another statement of the law of conservation of energy. It says minus Q hot equals plus Q cold. So what you're saying is energy is transferred. It is lost by the hot object and moves into the cold object. And all that energy has to be transferred. So this is really particularly useful when we talk about something that's called calorimetry. And you're going to see an a couple of examples of that. But basically what you're doing is you're talking about mixing different things in order to figure out what their temperature is going to be. So it says you have a 500 mil sample of water that is mixed with 10,000 mils of 10C water. And it says what will the temperature of the water be when the two samples are mixed together? So we're going to start off with the idea that we have the, 
the heat that is lost by the hot object is equal to the heat that is gained by the cold object. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write our given out, and we're going to do it in two different colors, just to kind of keep them separate between hot and cold. And so the first thing we have is we have a 500 mil sample of 100 C water. So that's going to be our hot. So we're going to say the initial temperature is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. We're going to say that the mass of the sample is going to be 0 0.5 kilograms. Now you may be wondering where I got that from. Uh, you should know that the density of water is 1 gram per mil. Okay, so the sample is going to be 500 grams, and I don't like things to be in, in grams, so I'm going to go ahead and change it to kilograms. So I've got that. That's going to be uh, the mass, and then now I can go ahead and say for the cold object, the cold sample, we have 10,000 milliliters. Once again, we're going to convert that all, um, and it's going to end up being the mass is going to be 10 kilograms, and the initial temperature of the sample is going to be 10 degrees Celsius. So, you can set it up into this particular formula right here, where I say Cm delta T. So, when you expand this formula out, what you're going to have is minus Cm delta T equals plus Cm delta T. Now, one thing that you should realize, for this particular example, they are both water. So, since they are both water, the C term is going to cancel out because it's going to be the same in both cases. So what this, this equation is going to simplify to is it's going to simplify to minus 0 0.5 and then remember the definition of delta T is T final minus T initial. And on the other side it's going to be excuse me, it's going to be 10 times Tf minus 10. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, I've got two different variables. I have the final temperature of the hot sample, and I've got the final temperature of the cold sample. But what I want you to realize in this particular case is that the two samples are mixed together, so they will actually move to thermal equilibrium. In other words, they will be the same temperature whenever they're mixed. So even though it looks like it's two different variables, it's really just one. So I'm going to go ahead and write the rest of it out in a single color so that we know that it's going to be the same in both cases. So when you solve this particular question, you would actually say that you have minus 0.5, and you would have to distribute that particular value. And when you distribute this particular value, you get negative 0.5 TF uh, plus 50 equals 10 TF uh, minus 100. So if you notice, you can go ahead and rearrange variables at this point, and it would make your life a little bit easier. Okay, But what you would say is you would say, move that over and you have 150 equals 10.5 TF. You would divide both sides by 10.5, uh, and your resulting answer would be, when you divide those out, the answer should be approximately TF is 14.3 degrees Celsius. And if you notice, that makes sense. It's in between the two samples, so it's less than 100 degrees. It's more than 10 degrees. It is closer to the 10 degrees because I had so much more of the 10 degree water. So you should be able to kind of predict what these are without really looking at, without really doing the math, get yourself a ballpark, and then make sure your answer matches what you expect. In this one it says, you have a blacksmith that's making a new axe for a customer. It says the axe has a mass of 5 kilograms, it's made of iron, and then it gives you the specific heat of iron, looks like it's missing a K there, um, and was heated up to 100 or 1500 degrees Celsius in order to shape. Uh, what will the final temperature of the axe be after it is plunged into a 100 kilogram tub of 23 degrees Celsius water? So, we have something that is hot, and that is the axe, and we have something that is cold, which is the water. So we're going to do the same process that we did before. We're going to say minus Q is equal to positive Q. Or in our case, minus Cm delta T is equal to positive Cm delta T. So, Remember, the axe is our negative side. So the negative 460 is going to be my specific heat capacity. If you notice, I didn't cancel them out in this case because I'm talking about an axe that's made out of iron and I'm talking about water. Those are different substances, so you can't cancel them out. So I have negative 460 times 5, and then you have your TF 
go ahead and change colors just so we can see it a little better. TF minus 1500. And then on the other side, in our blue, we're going to have uh, 4184, which is the specific heat of water, the fact that I have 100 kilograms of it, and finally you have your TF minus 23. So before we actually do the math, you should be able to predict that the temperature is going to be somewhere greater than 23 and somewhere less than 1500. It should be closer to the water, and there, there's a twofold reason why. The specific heat of water is almost 10 times greater, and then the mass of water is 20 times greater. So because of that, it should be skewed towards the 23 Celsius. So you're looking for something, I would imagine, somewhere less than 50, but let's go ahead and do the math just to check it and see. So, you would start by multiplying these two terms out, and when you do that, you can start to distribute everything. Um, so you would multiply out negative 460 times 5 times negative 1500, and then you would do the same thing on this side where you would multiply this out and distribute. Okay. Once you do that, you're going to have some number TF minus some number, some number TF minus some number, just like we talked about before and you should be able to get the answer as being TF is approximately 31 degrees Celsius. Now, if you're having a tough time doing this, check the math on the previous example, and then go ahead and make sure that you notice that and you, and you comment to your teacher that you need some help working out this particular example. The last example says, what is the initial temperature? Okay, so now we're looking for what the initial temperature is. That's just a little bit different. Um, of a one kilogram platinum hammer if it reaches nine degrees Celsius after being plunged into a 1.5 kilogram tub of 10 C water. Okay, so we have, once again, we have a hot object and a cold object. But one thing that I want you to realize is if you look, the temperature was 10 degrees for the water and now it's nine degrees for the water. So if you notice, the temperature of the water actually decreased. So in this particular example, the negative Q is going to be the water. And that's a little bit different than the examples we've done before. And then the cold object, the thing that's gaining the heat, is going to be the platinum hammer. So that's kind of different. So what? let's go ahead and take a look at it now. So we're going to say the hammer is positive Cm delta T. And then the water is negative Cm delta T. Once again, there are different substances, so the C's aren't going to cancel out. So you would plug in, you'd have 130 times, it's a one kilogram hammer, and you're trying to solve for the initial temperature, but you do know the final temperature in this case is going to be 9 degrees, so it's going to be 9 minus the initial temperature. And then on the other side, you're going to have that equaling. You'd have minus 4,184 times 1.5 times TF, which the TF is 9, times 10, or minus 10, is going to be a negative 1 degrees. So what you'll notice is you have a negative times a positive times a negative. You're going to end up with a positive number over here. You're going to go ahead and distribute. You're going to go ahead and solve. And you should find out that the initial temperature of the hammer was pretty low. It was about negative 39.3 degrees Celsius.